the lecture I want to present to you now is using this multiple scale uh, perturbation method. And one of the problems we're going to solve is the Van der Poel oscillator. What you're going to see in this example is sort of in some sense the full power of how this multiple scale expansion can be leveraged to start getting some really clear understanding and approximate solutions to this nonlinear oscillator which you cannot write down closed form solutions for. So we're going to go ahead and solve this problem and you're going to see all the very interesting features that arise from, uh, from how, how the multiple scales actually handles this by just defining two time scales at the same time. So here is the Van der Poel oscillator. And what I'm going to do now is define a small parameter epsilon, which is going to be related to the damping. In other words, this is a nonlinear damping term uh, where if u is bigger than 1, then this is actually damping. So the, if u is bigger than 1, this is a positive number, and this creates a damping effect. If u is less than 1, this is negative, and this is an amplification effect. So what tends to be exhibited, or what is exhibited in the Van der Poel oscillator, are limit cycle behaviors. If the amplitude's too big, it decays. If it's too small, it grows. And what you end up getting is an oscillatory behavior uh, which persists in this system from this nonlinear you know, damping effect, which is actually growth and damping combined, okay? depending upon the size of you. So the nonlinearity do, does a couple things that we want to start to understand. It, it shifts frequency, it generates harmonics, and in this case, there's a transient effect. If I have a low amplitude, it starts to grow until it saturates to that limit cycle. If it's very high, it decays until it gets to the limit cycle. This is something that regular perturbation theory certainly can't handle the frequency shifts, and it also can't handle this initial transient behavior that we need to capture if we want to understand what goes on in this Van der Poel oscillator. So we're going to introduce is this multiple scale expansion technique, which is really, what the, I believe, one of the most powerful perturbation techniques available to you to try to understand approximate solutions to these, let's say, more complicated nonlinear systems. So remember, the idea behind the multiple scale expansion is pretty simple. It's to introduce a new time scale. Let's call it tau, and tau is epsilon t. So what this is, is a slow time scale. So if t goes, for instance, from 0 to 1, and epsilon is 0.1, then tau goes from 0 to 0.1. So it's essentially a way of saying, I've got this slow time scale, so this t change has to change a lot for tau to change an order 1 amount. Okay, So that's the idea. Remember, epsilon is our small parameter. So what I'm going to do is not only introduce this slow time, but then now I'm going to make my solutions be a function of two time scales, t and tau. Unlike multiple scales, sorry, uh, unlike Poincare Lindstedt, where I traded out to a new time scale, stretch time, I retain my original time scale and introduce simply a second time scale as an independent variable. Even though you can clearly see here their relationship, I'm now going to treat tau as independent of t. So let's go back to the Van der Poel. And what's going to happen is whenever I take a derivative u of t, by chain rule, that derivative will be now u of t plus epsilon u of tau. And if I take two derivatives, this is what the chain rule gives me. Remember, u is no longer a function of t. It is a function of t and tau. So I have to accommodate for that change of variables using chain rule. And here's what the second derivative looks like for u t t. Now becomes it's a function of t and tau. This is what it looks like. Plus epsilon u squared minus 1. First derivative, u t plus epsilon u tau plus u. So this is now the Van der Poel written in the two time scale system, t and tau. Okay, So it's a function of those two scales. Now what you'll notice is the epsilon appears here. There's an epsilon squared here. In fact, the only terms without an epsilon are this utt and this u. So the leading order solution is only a function of the t scale. And that's going to be important in how we do this. So what we're going to do is do an expansion. And here's how the expansion is going to look. We're going to have expansion of u0 xt plus epsilon u1 xt and tau. 
That's the generic representation. Obviously here in the Vanderpool, we're only dealing with a time problem, but more broadly when you do multiple scales, if you had a function that was space and time, so a spatial temporal system, we'll consider this later in the class, then you, know, you would just simply broaden you know, your dependency both on t and tau, especially in the higher order terms. Okay? So once you plug this in, let's say to this Vanderpool oscillator, and again, it's, it's not a function of x, so it's just a function of t and tau, the leading order solution is u naught tt plus u naught equals zero. So in other words, the solution to this is going to be sines and cosines. More than that, it only depends upon the fast scale t, right? u naught tt plus u naught. It's independent of tau. The leading order equation is independent of the slow scale tau. And then I have some initial conditions. And remember, the initial conditions now are parametrized by the value of t and tau. So u naught 0 comma 0 means at t equals 0 and tau equals 0. I have alpha and u naught t at 0, 0 is equal to 0. So I have some alpha, which is the initial amplitude, and it starts from rest. Okay? Remember, u naught is a function of two variables, t and tau. So now I'll go to the next order, u1, tt plus u1. The right-hand side now is a function of u0 and its tau derivatives. Now, I just said that this, this here is this differential equation in the leading order is only a function of t, but what we're going to show is that the leading order solution has some constants, and those constants can be functions of the slow variable tau, and that's why it's going to be important here because these terms here, there is a tau derivative right there, u0 t tau, okay? And those are its initial conditions. And then you go to one higher order. And again, here's the right-hand side term. Okay? And what you need to have happen is the right-hand side forcings, right? how we're going to impose conditions on the slow time evolution is what we need is we need solvability to be satisfied. In other words, the right-hand side forcing terms have to be orthogonal to the null space of the adjoint operator. Okay? And this operator here is self-adjoint. So now what we're going to do is just impose that condition, get rid of secular growth terms. OK, so the leading order solution. There it is, cosines and sines. With some constants, a and b in front of them. But now, those constants, they're not really constants. They can be functions of tau, actually. Right? So at leading order, u naught, which only sat, it was only dictated by behaviors in t, gives you a solution of t, but then this a and b can be constants, uh, functions of tau. So your initial, your, uh, your leading order solution there is with some constants that, but now we're going to be able to determine some evolution of a, those constants, so that solvability is satisfied at higher order. So let's go to the next order. This is where all the action happens because we want to impose the solvability conditions, which are going to give us all this information about what does a, what has to happen with a and b in the slow evolution so that solvability is satisfied. So let's go here. Here is the right-hand side. So you have, at the next order, this is the forcing function. There it is. And I just solved for u0, which was a cosine t plus b sine t, where a and b were now functions of tau. So plug in that solution. You get all this here. There it is. And what I do with this is, I'm going to arrange all the terms. I'm going to do a lot of algebra to get down to this next form here, which is I'm going to pull out all the terms that are sine t. There they are. I also have sine 3t terms, cosine t terms, cosine 3t terms. The sine 3t and cosine 3t terms aren't in the null space, so I don't have to worry about them. They don't, I don't have to worry about solvability conditions with them. However, Sine t and cosine t are in the null space, and in fact, if they're around, are going to lead to secular growth. So what I really need to do is to take the coefficient of the sine t term, set it to 0, and I need to take the coefficient of the cosine t term, and also set it to 0. By the way, the step from here to here in working out algebra, it's quite intensive. So I just want to throw that out there. So this lecture is shorter, but behind the scenes was a lot of algebra to get steps from here to here, which normally I might work out on the board. But since this is YouTube, I'm not going to work it out. You don't ever do algebra in public if you can help it, or spell in public. So it's kind of nice with slides. I don't have to worry about uh, spelling or doing algebra in public. 
So that's a plus for these light board lectures. All right, so there you go. Set those to zero. That's the goal. So remember, I have this flexibility because A is a function of tau, B is a function of tau, and if I make them satisfy these evolution equations, then I have no problems with solvability. I've removed the secular growth terms that are possible. Okay? So there they are. And this simplifies greatly. In fact, if I take rho to be defined as a squared plus b squared, then I can multiply the top equation by a, bottom equation by b, add them together, and I get this first order nonlinear ODE, which is actually pretty easy to solve. You can use this. In fact, this is just use the integrating factor method from differential equations. It's like, uh, I, you know, most differential equations books, this is like one of the, f the first day or two is learning how to solve uh, equations of this form, okay? And so when you do that, here is the solution. You solve that, you get your solution, 4 alpha squared, alpha squared, 4 minus alpha squared, e to the minus tau. So first of all, let's talk about the behavior of this. What happens as tau gets big? Okay, so this here is going to go, e to the minus tau is going to go to zero. So this is all going to drop out, all these terms here, and you're going to get 4 alpha squared over alpha squared. So it's going to go to 4. So you're initially going to start off with some value, and this thing is going to exponentially decay to the value of 4. It's going to exponentially decay on a slow scale, e to the minus tau. Remember that minus tau is epsilon t. So if epsilon is small, that means it's going to take a long time for it to decay into that, to that solution, that state, that value of 4. So that's what the row of t is doing. Now let's contextualize it back in terms of the original variables that we were working with. So if that's what's going on with row of t, you can actually take the initial conditions you had for this problem, write rho, remember rho was a squared plus b squared, come back to that problem and you find the following, a of tau and b of tau are the following. So first of all, b of tau is zero, so that's out, and then a of tau is this coefficient here, it's two alpha over alpha squared plus four minus alpha squared. So it's this factor of 2 that got taken out, and so now let's look at what happens to, well, b of tau is 0, so we don't have to worry about it. a of tau, here it is, and notice what happens to a of tau. As t gets big, in other words, this tau goes to infinity, again, this term drops out, and then you have alpha squared to the 1 half power becomes alpha, so you get alpha over alpha, and this just goes to a value of 2. So this thing here, wherever it starts, whatever the initial conditions for A are, it decays to a value of 2 on a slow scale, which is given by that epsilon tau. Okay? That's the behavior of A of tau. Now what is A of tau? A of tau is the coefficient in front of the leading order solution. Remember, I assumed solutions are A, of a cosine and B sine. So you're going to take this A and you're going to throw it in front of the cosine. The b is 0, so you have b times sine. Well, the b is 0, so it's out. And so this is your leading order solution. But notice, I have the leading order solution there with cosine t, but I also have the slow evolution of a of tau. And notice what it does. This is so fascinating. So what you start with is you start with the initial conditions at some value of alpha. This thing slowly decays. Remember, I have that slow damping term. Slowly decays because I have this e to the minus tau, so I could put minus epsilon t there. So it slowly decays, and this whole thing takes on a value of 2. So it slowly decays until this thing is just 2 cosine t. So not only did I pick up the decay, if I went to higher order, I could also pick up frequency shifts if I wanted to, but we're going to stop here because this shows you an important thing that multiple scales can do. And in fact, I worked out the Vanderpool with the Poincaré Linstead, and the frequency shift that comes in this problem happens at order epsilon squared, right? So I'd have to go one higher order up to get the frequency shift. But the main thing that happens is that the amplitude at order epsilon decays down to this oscillatory solution. Poincaré Linstead, what we considered previously, assumed that you started on the limit cycle. This multiple scales expansion allows you 
to settle to the limit cycle behavior and stay on the limit cycle behavior. And like I said, if you wanted to compute the frequency correction, you'd have to go to a higher order to get that and get an epsilon squared correction to the frequency. But that is a lot of extra work. And it's not what I want to illustrate right now. I just want to illustrate here that multiple scales offer you more flexibility than either the regular perturbation expansion or Poincaré-Linstead. It can handle transients. It can handle frequency shifts. So it's really this very beautiful way to handle perturbation theory by defining either multiple times or multiple space scales and then expanding where you use either fast, slow structures and collecting terms. We're going to do a lot of this in what follows in this class. This is going to be our workhorse algorithm, separating time scales or separating space scales in order for us to get understanding out of fundamental systems and what nonlinearity is doing in these systems. So that's it for the Vanderpool oscillator and multiple scales for them.